Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Wednesday webinar, Social Security Disability for Fibromyalgia. My name is Caitlin Wildoner. I'm the founding attorney of Beacon Disability PLLC, which is a law firm based in Florida, where we exclusively practice federal administrative law, and we focus on getting you your disability benefits as quickly as possible so that you can focus on getting better. As I mentioned today, we are talking about social security disability for fibromyalgia. And before we go any further, I want to address a couple of things. Number one, I do not take questions on the live webinar. And the reason for that is not because I don't want to help. I do. The reason for that is because we often need more information to give a solid answer. And so instead of trying to get your information in front of other individuals, what I ask is that you schedule a time to chat with me one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll go ahead and drop that link in the chat on the live now. If you're watching on the replay, that link to schedule a call will be down below. Always happy to help if we can. So please do feel free to schedule that call. The second thing is today's webinar is not legal advice, but is instead intended to give additional background and information for those individuals who have fibromyalgia who are considering applying for Social Security disability benefits. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Here is our roadmap for today. Um, most of our webinars, if you've watched any of them before, they follow a very similar path. Um, we start out talking about social security disability basics and guidance. Um, usually we will talk about a listing. Fibromyalgia does not really have a listing. So instead today we are talking about a social security ruling that will show us what the agency is looking for in fibromyalgia claims. We'll also talk about some considerations. And then finally, we close out with how an attorney may be able to help you with your social security disability claim. A little bit about me, as I mentioned before, my name is Caitlin Wildoner. I am the founding attorney of Beacon Disability PLLC, which is a law firm where we're based in Florida, where we exclusively practice federal administrative disability law. We do help clients outside the state of Florida. It does depend on your specific situation as to whether it's something that we might be able to help with. Um, but do feel free to reach out to us and see if it is something that we can help with, or if you have just a couple of questions that we might be able to shed some light on or help you get some answers on. There are two different social security disability programs. They both require that you be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months. You don't have to be out of work for 12 months before you apply. It just has to be expected that you'll be out of work for 12 months. Um, so don't necessarily wait to apply, particularly if you're applying for SSI. SSI benefits are not payable until the first full month after the application. So you want to apply sooner rather than later for SSI benefits, um, but you also will need to make sure, of course, that the medical records do reflect that you are expected to be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months due to one or more severe medically determinable impairment, which does include physical and mental impairments. Where the programs differ is SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, is going to require that you have worked and paid into the Social Security system for a set amount of time. That time does vary depending on your age. Generally speaking, we do say five of the last 10 years is what you will have had to work and you will have paid into the system before you are able to pull from those benefits. If you do not have that sufficient work history, what you're going to look at instead is Supplemental Security Income or SSI benefits that does not have a work history requirement, but instead it does have income and asset restrictions and thresholds that you cannot exceed. The income restrictions vary depending on household size, so I don't cover those. The asset thresholds are much easier, and they're all black and white, um, but there's only two asset thresholds. And that's you can't have more than $2,000 in assets if you are single and more than $3,000 in assets if you are married and still qualify for SSI benefits. So again, in addition to the asset restrictions, there are income limitations for the household as well that you will want to look into only for SSI. SSDI does not have those same requirements. When you submit your initial social security disability application, whether it's SSDI or SSI, 
the first thing they're going to look at is that second prong. Do you have a sufficient number of work credits for SSDI? Or are you below the income and asset thresholds for SSI? It is possible to apply for both programs at the same time if you have the sufficient work credits and you are below the income and asset thresholds for SSI. Some people will only qualify for one or the other due to that second prong. So that's kind of step zero. Before Social Security gets into the five-step medical evaluation, that's what they look at. As long as you meet that second prong for benefits, the case will move to step one of the five-step evaluation process where the agency is going to look to see, are you currently engaging in substantial gainful activity? Right now, that's defined as, are you working 20 hours a week or more, or are you earning more than $1,470 a month in gross earnings? If you are working more than that or earning more than that, then you are engaging in substantial gainful activity. And by definition, you cannot be found disabled under Social Security's rules. If you are not engaging in substantial gainful activity, the case will move to step two, where the agency is reviewing the medical records to determine, do you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment? If you don't have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, the analysis will stop there. Social Security will deny your claim. They'll say you don't have any severe impairments. So again, by our definition, you cannot be found disabled. As long as you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, they will move to step three, where they will look to see, do you meet or equal a listing? As I mentioned earlier, fibromyalgia doesn't really have a listing. So in this case, the answer is likely going to be you don't meet or equal a listing unless you have additional conditions and, and limitations that are preventing you from working that might meet or equal a listing. Um, but if you don't, it's okay. They'll move to step four. If you do meet or equal a listing, then you're approved at step three. So moving on to step four, which is where most, most claims with fibromyalgia tend to hang out, is they look to see, okay, can you go back to your past relevant work? Your past relevant work is work that you have performed in the last 15 years long enough to learn how to perform the job. So if you can go back to your past work, even with your fibromyalgia and the limitations, you're not going to be disabled according to their rules, and they will issue a denial letter. If you cannot go back to your past relevant work, what they will look at then is, are there any other jobs that exist in the national economy that you can do with your limitations? If there are other jobs, you'll get a step five denial. If there are no other jobs that you can do with your limitations, then you can get an approval at step five. So that's a very broad and quick and dirty overview of the five-step evaluation process and how it works. What we're going to talk about here in a minute um, is the social security ruling, which is focused more on step two, um, focused mostly on getting social security to agree that fibromyalgia is a severe medically determinable impairment. So that's what they're going to be looking at. Um, as you are likely aware, um, fibromyalgia kind of runs the gamut. Um, some people have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia and they're able to navigate life perfectly fine. Others have that diagnosis. And unfortunately theirs is a little bit different and they cannot navigate life perfectly fine. They do have significant limitations. Um, so it does differ. There's kind of a spectrum of fibromyalgia, just like there's a spectrum of most types of impairments and disabilities. Um, but that's what we'll talk about in just a minute. The important thing to realize is that adults can qualify for social security disability benefits if their residual functional capacity is less than what their past relevant work would require and or it prohibits them from engaging in substantial gainful activity on a regular and ongoing basis. This may mean that they're able to may mean that they are unable to sustain competitive employment and adults over age 50 may qualify for benefits using something called the grid rules. We've done webinars on the grid rules before. We've done little videos on the grid rules before. If you are between the ages of 50, 55, 55 and 59, or 60 to 65, I encourage you to go look at some of those videos. Um, they don't totally explain the grid rules as um, 
I would to, to talking to a judge, but they do give a little bit more insight and color into what the grid rules are and how they may be beneficial in your specific case. Um, SSI benefits, again, are only payable to children and adults who have limited resources and income. And SSDI benefits are only payable to adults who have either earned a sufficient number of credits or children whose parents are deceased, retired, or disabled. We don't see fibromyalgia in children a whole lot, um, but I do like to cover kind of the differences between the two as it relates to children, just in case. All right, so here we are looking at SSR 12-2P, which is the evaluation of fibromyalgia. It's not a listing, but it's instead guidance on how the agency views fibromyalgia cases. According to the Social Security Administration, a physician has to diagnose the fibromyalgia and that diagnosis cannot be contrary to other evidence that exists in the file. And what they really look at are the 1990 ACR criteria for the classification of fibromyalgia or the 2010 ACR preliminary diagnostic criteria. And I'll talk about each of those again in a minute. This is to help the agency determine what they're looking for to see, do you have that severe medically determinable impairment of fibromyalgia? So here's the 1990 ACR criteria. It does require a history of widespread pain that has persisted for at least three months. Widespread pain, by the way, includes all four quadrants of the body. So you have to have pain in all four quadrants of the body in order for there to be considered widespread pain. The pain does not have to be constant. It can fluctuate, but it is important that the pain is in all four, all four quadrants of the body. And you'll see here, it is also going to require at least 11 positive tender points on physical examination. The tender points have to be positive bilaterally. Um, it does not mean that you have to have the same tender points on the same side positive. It just means that you have to have tender points on both sides of the body. You also have to have tender points above and below the waist. Um, so as you can see, here are the different tender points. Um, and I kind of, okay. Um, no, that's right. Um, so you've got to have at least 11. Um, so again, and those tender points, some of them have to be above the waist. Some of them have to be below the waist. Some have to be on the left side of the body. Some have to be on the right side of the body. Okay. So that's what they're going to look at. That is, if you see a rheumatologist, sometimes primary cares will do it. Um, but you'll see if you're looking at your medical records that they do talk about positive tender points. They will often either circle them on kind of a, a person drawing or they'll write them out included in the chart. And so that's what social security is looking for in the 1990 ACR criteria in order to find fibromyalgia as that severe impairment. And here uh, is the 2010 ACR preliminary diagnostic criteria. Again, it's going to require that same definition of a history of widespread pain, which if you'll remember is pain in all four quadrants of the body that's persisted for at least three months. It's also going to require, instead of tender points, it's going to require repeated manifestations of at least six fibromyalgia symptoms, signs, or co-occurring conditions, including and especially fatigue, cognitive or memory problems, waking up unrefreshed, depression, anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, all of those things. Um, if you've got medical documentation of those types of repeated manifestations, and there's evidence that other disorders that might cause those manifestations are excluded, okay? So it's, it's a little bit of a different criteria, but that is the alternate way for Social Security to review the medical records and to find that fibromyalgia does exist as a severe medically determinable impairment in your claim. All right, so as you can see, and this is the case in all disability cases, medical records are paramount. Um, functional capacity can also be relevant, particularly in fibromyalgia cases, since there's not a fibromyalgia listing per se. Um, it does often go down to functional capacity and what you are and are not able to do with your specific fibromyalgia limitations. And again, the issue in adult social security disability cases that don't meet a listing is not just can you go back to your past work, 
but can you perform any job that exists in the national economy? I can't tell you how many times in a week, in a month, I talk to people and I my heart goes out to them because they there's no way they can continue doing what they've been doing, whether that's construction work, whether that's steel work, whether that's nursing, um, teaching, different things like that. There's no way that they can continue doing that, but they're under 50. And so social security has a wide range of other jobs that they're going to say, well, you could go do this. Even though it's not what you're trained to do, it's not what your work history has supported you in doing, might not even make the same income that you historically have, but the job still exists. You can still do it within your limitations. So that's the really important thing to remember is it's not just knocking out your past work, but it's knocking out all work. And that goes for all individuals. It's just a little bit tougher to do for those that are under age 50 because we don't have the grid rules helping us out. All right, we are at the end of the webinar. We close out the webinar always the same way with how an attorney can help you. As I always say, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, this is just a sampling of some of the things that we do. We do provide guidance on what correspondence from Social Security actually means. If you've ever gone through a Social Security claim, you know that you will get paperwork and paperwork and paperwork. Um, and that sometimes it's hard to know what they're looking for. What does this mean? What do I do? Do I need to act? Do I need to just sit here? What, what do I need to do? Um, so we provide that guidance. We file necessary appeals, either if you are already a client of ours or if you become a client of ours in enough time after that denial. We do review your medical records in your case file. We can discuss what additional records might be helpful in your case. We review your documents for accuracy and completeness and discuss what Social Security is looking for in their requested forms. Um, we don't fill out those forms for you. The adult function report, supplemental pain questionnaire, supplemental headache, cardiac, anxiety, all of those supplemental questionnaires are sent out to you to get, so Social Security can have a better understanding of what limitations you specifically have as a result of your condition. So we don't know. We we are not in your shoes. We are happy to review them. We are happy to talk about them with you. But the actual filling out of those forms, we do often ask for you to do. Um, we do work with you to provide relevant updates to Social Security throughout your claim and from Social Security throughout your claim. If you get to the hearing stage, we do prepare you for that hearing before an administrative law judge, and then we will question you and any witnesses during your hearing, okay? Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm always happy to help in any way that I can. Please do feel free to reach out. You can give us a call, send us an email. We'll go ahead and drop the link to schedule a call again in the chat on the live. It is down below on the replay. If you have questions, always please feel free to reach out. We're always happy to help and do anything that we can to help or point you in the right direction. So thank you so much for watching and joining us today. Have a wonderful day.